Wow, that's really good. My name is Matthew Horky. For the last six years, I've been traveling around the world, visiting wine regions in search of the most unique, exciting, and expensive wines in the world. But that's not what today is all about. Today, we're going to taste sub $20 wine that's all received 90 plus points. So I've got six wines here. We're going to find out if they're all worth one of your Andrew Jacksons. One of the big hurdles that keeps people from really enjoying wine is the complexity. And scores are meant to simplify that. Especially the 100 point system that's based on the old school system. 90 points plus is an A. So if a wine gets 90 points, it must be good, right? Well, not exactly. In the past, there are fewer critics that really mattered, namely Robert Parker of the Wine Advocate and Wine Spectator. But now there are a lot of names out there, and it can be really difficult to know who to trust. Just because a wine scored 90 points just means it showed well to that particular person in that moment in time. Just think back to your school days. That test score was just reflective of how well you recalled the information on that particular day. And it can be tough when you're throwing all these 90 point scores all over the place, you see them all over the shelves, it can be really, really confusing. I've got six different wines all scored by different critics. Let's see if they're right and these wines are worth your money. First we have a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. This is the Gieson Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc 2020. Got the classic screw cap. I'm not scared of screw caps, I like them. In the industry they're known as Stelvin closures. This wine got 90 points from Wine Spectator and cost only eight bucks. So on paper, it sounds pretty good. Wine Spectator is one of the few publications that claims that they taste all the wines blind. So generally, Wine Spectator scores tend to be a little bit lower. On paper, this seems like a steal. 90 points for a fresh white wine. New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I think that almost anybody can really pick out. They often can really smell like kiwi fruits and fresh cut grass. Maybe even a touch of kefir lime. It smells pretty good actually, but again, this is my first wine of the day. Usually when you're tasting a lot of wines, the first wine usually tastes pretty darn good. Sauvignon Blancs, especially from New Zealand, can tend to be quite explosive up front. A lot of fruit flavors almost hit you like a, <laughs> like a ton of bricks. And then they can start to fall short, they can really start to trick you. I think this wine is of really good quality. 90 points? I'd be close in my book. I don't know if I'd quite give it 90, but still, I give it a thumbs up. Next, we have the Domaine de la Vivant, the Côte de Provence, uh, 2020. This is a rosé. 90 points from Robert Parker's The Wine Advocate, 1599. The rosés from the south of France are really popular, especially those from Provence. I think that the ones from Provence sometimes can be a little bit too pricey. I don't see a great breakdown on this label, but usually these rosés from Provence are made from grapes like Grenache, Cinso, Morvedre, Carignan. A lot of producers around the world try to copy the Provencal style of rosé because they're just light, refreshing, they can be really delicious. If you're looking for value, I would go over a region in the south of France called the languedoc Roussillon. Very close by, similar grapes, similar quality, and sometimes half the price. 90 points from Wine Advocate, pretty big score. Let's take a look. For a good rosé, I want flavors of watermelon, strawberry, maybe some orange peel, and maybe a little bit of that Mediterranean brush. Kind of reminds me of being in the south of France or the south of Italy, seeing all the thyme, sage trees all over the place, the wind blowing, just kind of smelling that, what the French call garrigue. Smells good, not bad. This wine kind of tricked me. Up front, it smelled nice, it smelled like a nice rosé. On the palate, it just doesn't have a lot of intensity that I'm looking for. 90 points uh, for me, no. Let's move on. Next we have the Pinot Project. California Pinot Noir 2019, 91 points. Wine enthusiast, $10.99. Wine Enthusiast has really turned itself more into a lifestyle publication. I generally find the scores are about two points high in terms of my palate. I see this wine got 91 points. In my mind, I think of it more as like an 88, 89 point type of wine. By the way, I bought all these wines from Total Wine & More. They're not sponsoring this video, but hey, Total Wine & More if you're watching. Other wine shops kind of step it up. Contact me. Good, inexpensive Pinot Noir is really hard to come by. 
The grape was made famous by the region of Burgundy in France where prices have shot up and the film Sideways back in the early 2000s. That being said, I'm really skeptical of Pinot Noirs that are under 20 bucks. On paper, this sounds good. If it's really good, it's going to get a big thumbs up from me. I see it's distributed my Skernick Winery. Look at the back label, the importers. If you find an importer that brings in wines that you really like, you might want to follow their portfolio. Again, it says California, so the grapes can come from the entire state, not a particular region. Wine geeks really covet location, location, location. If grapes come from a specific region or a specific vineyard or site, that means they're going to cost a premium price. This smells like Pinot Noir. And when I smell New World Pinot Noir, especially those from California, I think of cool raspberry type flavors, maybe sour strawberry. Just subtle earth notes, almost like you're where I grew up. We grew up with woods all around us. During the fall, if you walk around, smell the damp leaves, that damp forest floor, Pinot Noir can really smell like that. On the nose, this is quite complex. You know, wine is so subtle, especially the flavors. When I'm talking about some of these flavors, it's not like it literally tastes like red raspberry. There are over a thousand volatile compounds in wine. There are a lot of subtle flavors, but when you have an inexpensive wine like this with a lot of complexity, I'm actually really impressed. Really good. <laughs> 10 dollars Wow. Mmm. That's really good. You like Pinot Noir? Recommended. Next up, we have a Bordeaux. Bordeaux is home to some of the most prestigious, some of the most expensive wines in the world, but there's also a lot of value to be found. This is the Chateau La Ribou. My French is terrible, but in English we'd say Chateau La Ribaud, maybe, or Ribaud, but in French it's Chateau La Ribou. 2016. I love Bordeaux. Bordeaux is a wine that really needs to be aged. 2016 is a great vintage. Usually vintages don't really matter when you're starting to learn about wine, but Bordeaux, that's where it really matters, especially when you're drinking the wine on the younger side. This wine got 91 points from James Suckling and was less than 18 bucks. James Suckling's claim to fame is that he was the editor-in-chief to Wine Spectator for many, many years. Then he branched off and kind of started his own thing. A lot of people in the industry kind of make fun of him. His scores for me tend to also be a little on the high side, two to three points, but he reviews and scores a lot of wine, so I'm thankful for that. Once again, you just got to find somebody that you agree with. Also, if you're looking for value Bordeaux, Bordeaux is classified into different tiers. This says Cru Bourgeois. This is a classification of more inexpensive wine wines that you can get in the 15 to 25 dollar range i would check this out if you want to get into bordeaux oh the bordeaux got a gold medal in the citadel du vin during the first year of covid it looked like i was actually going to judge in that competition but look what happened in the world medals are like a piece of flair thick office space brian has 37 pieces of flair on today Okay. A terrific smile. Bordeaux is home to some of the most famous grapes in the world. Like here, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Malba. On paper, this sounds pretty good. Let's see. It actually smells really awesome. Like more serious, like really awesome. It smells like Bordeaux. Black cherry, black currant, leather, cedar kind of tobacco. It li literally, good Bordeaux can smell like leather cigar ash. I know that sounds a little bit unattractive. But in wine, it's really good. Wow. The nose kind of tricks me. The palate isn't as promising as the nose, but still a good wine. When you get into more inexpensive wines, that tends to happen a lot. Except on this Pinot Noir. Wow. If you're used to drinking Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot and you switch over to Bordeaux, sometimes it can be a little bit hard because they're not as fruity. Usually have more acid, make your mouth water a little bit more. Is it 91 points? I think that's a bit high, but would I buy this and drink it? Absolutely yes. And I'd love to age this and see how this goes. Pretty good wine. Next up is a wine from a region that really delivers value. Bodegas Goru. This is the gold blend. The region is Humilla. 93 points. Wine Spectator at $10.99. So this could be a steal. Once again, when I saw this, 93 points, Wine Spectator, that means the wine could be really impressive. Humilla, Yecla, in the south of Spain are regions where you can get wines that are really undervalued. The primary grape is Monastrel, also known as Morvedra or Mataro. You also see Grenache, some Cabernet Sauvignon, some other stuff as well. I'm really excited to taste this. This wine is mostly Monastrel with a little bit of Syrah, a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon. Once again, when I think of a southern Spanish wine, a high score like that, I think it could be big, fruity, oaky, uh, the type of wine that a lot of people like to drink. 
This smells like a big wine. This is the type of wine you give to somebody and sometimes people smell it. People that don't have a ton of experience with wine, they say, it just smells strong. Black cherry, burnt leather, almost plummy-like aromas. But I'm very surprised. Sometimes these inexpensive wines can just smell like vanilla and oak, so I'm really happy. This is a big, big wine. A lot of people are gonna like it because the tannins don't strip your mouth. They don't dry your mouth up. They're kind of round, they massage your mouth. For me, I much more prefer the Bordeaux style of wine. 93 points. To me, no, not really. But I think a lot of people are gonna like this. That's the thing about wine too. You have two different palates. The general consumer likes bigger, bolder, richer flavors, while people that work in the industry, like myself, tend to like wines that are a little bit more leaner, have a little more subtleties, a little more earthy complexities, maybe like this Bordeaux. And that's why it can be so difficult to communicate wine. Next wine. This is from Argentina. This is the Trevento Golden Reserve Malbec 2018. This has 97 points from Decanter. $17.99. One problem I have with competitions like this and medals like this, people see 97 points. Oh my gosh, it must be like the best wine in the world. Competitions are a business. Yes, they're designed to help the consumer, but they're also designed to help the wineries sell wine. I judge in a lot of these international competitions, and the threshold for medals just keeps going up and up. Think about it. If you're a producer, you get back a wine that has a gold or platinum medal, it says 95, 97 points, you're super happy. My wine's the best in the world. Oh! I have a lot of respect for the decanter competition. I do have friends that judge there. This is just for me. When I see wines from decanter that have gotten gold medals or platinum medals, they say 95, 97 points. To me, they generally end up being 90.1 type wines. Good wines, but not great. A lot of people think about Argentina when they think about the Great Malbec, but it's actually from Bordeaux, France. It was taken over there by immigrants, and all of a sudden it started doing really well. Argentinian Malbecs tend to be pretty round, pretty big, fruity, approachable, and because of the economies of scale, they can make really affordable wines. Let's take a look here. This smells like the biggest, the boldest out of all these. I think, I think black plum, uh, blueberry, black cherry, maybe a little bit of chocolate. <laughs> I'm really happy though. These wines are not too oaky. This is the biggest, the boldest, the roundest wine out of all these. This is the friendliest wine. This is the most crowd-pleasing wine. 97 points. Not to me, definitely. But I do think nice wine to bring to a party, a barbecue. I think a lot of people will enjoy it. Try to find a critic that your palate generally tends to agree with. If you like James Suckling wines that are always 91 points, maybe you should always kind of follow him. At the wine shop, a lot of the owners like to put shelf talkers, especially if wine's gotten scores. But ask a store employee what he or she really thinks about the wine. People that work in wine shops tend to be really passionate. And I have to come away with the winners. The winners for me were definitely this, this Pinot Project, the Pinot Noir. I thought it was very, very good. Something I might want to drink tonight. This Bordeaux. You have to kind of like a little bit more acidity, a little more earthy notes. What do you think about scores? Who do you tend to trust? Let me know in the comments below. And I'll see you guys soon.